All right, turn to Matthew 10. We left off seeing how Jesus was moved with compassion. Um, we saw that means love in action. The reason was he saw the multitudes of people that were in every city that he was traveling to as wandering sheep who had no shepherd. They were weary. They were being harassed. The, the word weary means harassed in, in the Greek. Uh, they were being scattered. In other words, the spiritual leaders throughout Israel at that time were not pointing the people to the Lord. They had done nothing but place heavy burdens upon the children of Israel, upon the, the people of Israel. And it was just that burden of religion. So everywhere Jesus went, uh, it became very obvious that the religious leaders were actually keeping the people from knowing the Lord, keeping the people away from a relationship with God. And this is why Jesus came to the people of Israel. The Bible says salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was born a Jew. He was of the tribe of Judah. He came from heaven to earth. He came to specifically win the Jewish people to him first and foremost. Paul says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. So Jesus' ministry was to the Jews first. And so he's not only fulfilling all the perfect requirements of the law, but he's also revealing the hearts of God the Father to the Jewish people. Now, as we look at the chaos in the world around us today, it's no different than it was back in his day. You know, people are still scattered. They're still wandering aimlessly. They're weary. They're worn out. Christians are scattered because there's so many bad shepherds out there, so many pastors who care less about the Lord's people. They care less about God's Word. They care more about uh, themselves. They care more about feeding their bank accounts. They care more about being popular and liked. And, you know, they want their $50 million jets to fly around and then stay in $20,000 a night hotels. And I can name a lot of names. You've heard them before. But it's just amazing how so many people, they're not feeding God's sheep, but these guys are feeding God's sheep a bunch of cotton candy. They're giving them everything they need, but... What Peter says is the milk of the word, and Paul says is the meat of the word, by which we grow healthy and strong in the Lord. Once in a while, I'll listen to some of their sermons, and I think, what in the world are you guys doing? What are you talking about? You're going to stand before the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and give an account for why you misled God's people by teaching everything and everything uh, and anything but the word of God. There's nothing biblical about what they're saying or doing, and, it, and it's hard for me not to get mad and grieve over God's flock of sheep because we are his beloved children. We are sheep in his flock. We are his saints because so many of them are being used and abused and led by wolves in sheep's clothing. The days in which we are living are very much like it was in the days we read about in the book of Judges. I encourage you, encourage you to read the book of Judges because it tells us over and over again, everyone was doing what is right in their own eyes. They could care less about what God's Word says. They just wanted to do what was fun and popular. And so God, and He is doing this to our nation right now, He would allow things to happen in the nation of Israel to bring them to their knees. He would send in enemies that would attack them, and they would get so down, so discouraged, that pretty soon they were crying out to God and repenting. So God would send a deliverer. That's why it's called the book of Judges. They were known as judges, like Samson and others, Gideon. And he would send them in, and they would wipe out the enemies of you know, Israel, and they would also start looking to the Lord. They'd walk with him for a season. But it was a roller coaster ride. They would be walking with the Lord, then as soon as things settled down, they would go back to their pagan ways and their fleshly ways, 13 times, 13 judges he would bring, and they kept going up and down like a roller coaster. It all came to a head, so to speak, when God allowed the Babylonians, this wicked nation of the north, to come into Jerusalem in 586 B.C., destroy Jerusalem, destroy their beloved temple, haul the Jews off to captivity, and um, that was in 586. They were there for 70 years, and you know King Nebuchadnezzar, was just a ruthless man. I think he got saved somewhere along the lines through the ministry of Daniel. But God loved his people. And that's why he would send these prophets to warn them. And one of the most 
amazing prophets of all. During that time, for 40 years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, was the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a passion for God. He had, a, he had compassion for God's people. And yet, for 40 years, he didn't see converts. For 40 years, the leaders in Israel mocked him. They ridiculed him. They, they blasphemed the Lord. They, you know, he was just speaking the truth in love, the truth of God's word. But like Jesus, Jeremiah wept over what he saw. In fact, when Jesus was asked, asking his disciples, hey, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? One of the responses was, well, some say you're Jeremiah, because Jesus was so much like Jeremiah, just with that passion for God, that passion for the compassion for the people. It was Peter who said, well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But again, as a nation, we're living just like it was in Jeremiah's day. See if this sounds familiar. You can read the book of Jeremiah, it's so amazing, but in a you know, small sample, Jeremiah chapter 5, starting in verse 26, it says, For among my people are found wicked men. This is God speaking, among his people. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men as a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. Sounds like some of our you know, religious leaders, more likely our political leaders, that's what they're doing. How's this sound? They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper in the right to the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? And he's speaking of his beloved nation, Israel. And he's going to do the same thing with our country and every country during the Great Tribulation. But again, this sounds a lot like our country today. Instead of defending the fatherless and the needy, many political leaders and even many church leaders are growing in their support of abortion. It just blows me away when you, and there's all these pastors, pastorettes coming out saying we are pro abortion. We're pro choice. They don't say pro abortion. We're pro choice. Listen, folks, uh, abortion has never been a political issue. Abortion is a moral issue, it's a spiritual matter. It goes way beyond whether you're pro life or pro choice. It goes to the core are you pro God or anti God? That's what it boils down to. Jesus makes this crystal clear that Satan came to steal, kill, destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And that life begins in the womb. Jesus says that in Matthew 19, verse 14, let the little ch children come to me and do not forbid them for, for as of such is the kingdom of heaven. Earlier in, in uh, Matthew, in chapter 18, he talks about how those who cause a little one who believes in me to stumble, it'd be better to have a millstone, a big you know, stone with a hole in it that they'd crush the grain with, hung around their neck, thrown into the sea, rather than cause these little ones to stumble. Jeremiah goes on to say in Jeremiah 5, verse 30, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, just like today, the priests rule by their own power. And here's the sad part. My people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? So many people love to hear lying words of the false prophets and teachers. They didn't want to hear about sin. They didn't want to hear about repentance. They didn't want to hear about God's righteousness as so many today don't want to hear about sin. I have hear people all the time, oh, I've been in this church for years, and they never talk about the last days. They never talk about sin. They never talk about judgment, repent. They want everybody to pat it on the back. Have a good day. This is your best life now. Well, it might be. Be careful. They didn't want to hear the truth about these things. And like Paul says at the end of uh, 2 Timothy, before he is put to death, you know, they, they're going to accumulate teachers that all they want to do is tickle their ears. So be careful. 
Here we are 2,600 years after Jeremiah, about 2,000 years after Jesus, and nothing much has changed. People are still in rebellion against God. People are still scattered like sheep. People are still desperate and hurting and weary and tired. But here's the most important thing to remember. You and I, we still need God's compassion for those around us. Jesus didn't come here to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He's commissioned us, as we'll see here in a moment with these 12, that we are commissioned to take good news out to people who are lost and hurting and desperate. Jesus still wants to use people like us to reach out and minister His grace and His mercy and His love and His compassion. We left off in chapter 9 um, with Jesus telling us, let's look at 9, verse 37 and 38. We just breezed over this last time. But at the very end of Matthew 9, he says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus never intended to, to do ministry alone. That's amazing to me. His plan was always to use people like us to do the work of ministry. He did all the heavy lifting, so to speak. I mean, he's the one that went to the cross. He's the one that shed his blood. He's the one that died for the sins of the world. He's the one that rose from the dead. He's the one that imparted to us the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives us his power to do what he's called us to do. He's the head. We're just the body of Christ. But because he rose from the dead, he can use us to bring that good news to those around us. And it's that simple gospel message that will set captives free. Um, from the bondage of their sin. It'll give them eternal life to everyone who will put their faith alone in Christ alone. It's the ultimate privilege and blessing that Jesus has given us to partner with Him. Like when we talk about go give hope, you know, this is a partner with Jesus because He's the one using these guys to go out to these unreached villages that have never heard about Jesus to give them the gospel message. And we'll see a lot of what Go Give Hope does in this chapter. We're not going to get through it, obviously, today, because I'm not even in the first verse yet. But, you know, there's so many things that we can relate to, principles He's given us. But notice that Jesus says here, this is His harvest, the last two words of chapter 9. It's His harvest. The time to harvest is now. It's not tomorrow, it's not next week, it's not next year. Oh yeah, well, I'll get around to it someday. No, today is a day of salvation, as Paul tells us. I love what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 35. Check that, this verse out. He tells His disciples, Do not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. When the fields were turning white, it meant that that was overripe. And if you don't get out there and glean the fields and you know harvest the fields, it's going to be too late. It's going to rot. So don't delay is what Jesus is saying. When you think about all the lost and hurting people who are all around us, it becomes very overwhelming to think about. But this is why Jesus tells us to pray because often when we start praying about people and needs and situations, the, gar the, the Lord will put that on our hearts. God will put these things into our hearts and minds as we pray for others. And then we see, oh, maybe He wants to use me to meet the needs that I see around me. Then you'll experience the reality of what it means to be light and salt in this world. To me, one of the greatest you know, things to be excited about is that Jesus wants us to be co-laborers with Him. When I first heard about being a co-laborer with Christ, I'm like, nah, He doesn't want me. Jesus can do a much better job than I can, and He does. He can, but He uses us. He wants us to serve with Him. It just blows my mind. But this is what Paul describes as his role and our role in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 through 11. He says, I planted, Apollos watered. So he says, all I'm doing is scattering seed, putting out the gospel, giving people the word of God. That's the seed of the word. Apollos, another co-labor, he's watering those seeds. But notice, God gave the increase so that neither he who plants 
is anything. Don't want to pop your little bubble, but that's what he says. So neither he who plants is anything. I'm nothing. I'm just planting the seeds of God's word. Nor he who waters. We're just doing what God calls us to do. But God who gives the increase. Again, it's all about the Lord. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. You know, he's the head of the body. We are the body of Christ. And he uses all of us to do whatever he's called us to do. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed, be careful, how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And he'll go in to talk about, there'll be those that build with gold, silver, precious stones. There'll be others who build with hay, wood, and stubble or straw. It's all going to go through the refiner's fire, so which ones do you think will last? Obviously, obviously those that are built with gold, silver, precious stones, or things that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit. Things we do in the flesh as Christians, which we all do, I'm going to make this happen. You know, I'm going to force the gospel on this person whether they want to hear it or not. Pretty soon that becomes hay, wood, and straw. We waste our time and it just burns up in the end. So be careful, he says, how you build. Walk in the Spirit. As we come into chapter 10, Jesus will call these 12 disciples and he's going to get this whole chapter deals with him preparing them, giving them principles as to what to do, how to do ministry when you go out there into the, the harvest. So chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power, take note of that word power, over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these, and we'll look at those in a moment. So right after he tells them to pray, okay, guys, I want you to pray about, you know, the Lord sending out harvesters into the field. And then he's like, they come back, hey, we prayed. Good, I heard your prayers. I'm sending you. And so be careful what you pray for. He sends them out. And again, as we just saw in the first part of chapter, or verse 2, the names of the 12 apostles. These 12 disciples are now the first time called apostles. It simply means one who is sent forth with a commission. The word, the, uh, the word was used for Greeks to denote the personal representatives of the king. And so they were sent out to represent the king in various cities, villages throughout Israel. And what they are to proclaim is the king Jesus has come. Notice it says Jesus gave them power over the unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and disease. As we will see, and this is very important, this was a temporary power that he gave them. And we know this is the case because the power they would receive from the Holy Spirit would not come upon them until the day of Pentecost which is about two years away from what we're reading here. This is what Jesus told them before he ascended up into heaven. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, just before he ascends into heaven, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The word he uses for power is dunamis. Dunamis. It's power from the Holy Spirit. It's a dynamic, that's what dunamis means, dynamic power. It can also be translated dynamite, but we're not to go around and blow everybody up. That's a whole different matter. That's what Muslims do. That's not what we do. That's not the dunamis power of the Spirit. It's the same word, dunamis, that he uses in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Again, right before he ascends, he says, But you shall receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. By the way, the same dunamis power that was on these 12, well, 11, we'll see why in a moment, only 11, Judas Iscariot didn't make it, 
But this power that the Holy Spirit gives all of us, He gives for the purpose of being witnesses for Him to do whatever He's called you to do. We don't do whatever we do in our own power and strength. We need to rely on Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit's power that is available to all of us at all times. Now, I bring this up because that power of the Holy Spirit is different than the power Jesus mentions here. When he says here in verse 1, he's giving them power. The Greek word is exousia, E-X-O-U-S-I-A. It means authority. It's not the Holy Spirit power upon them. It's the power Jesus gives them by His authority. Jesus is giving them royal authority, you might say, of the king to do these miraculous things. This is different than the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's a couple years away. Why um, am I making an issue of this? Because... Do you know who one of these guys who received this exousia power is? It's Judas Iscariot. He was not saved. He's not born again. The power of the Holy Spirit, dunamis, is only for born-again Christians. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, that is when you're saved. He seals you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives you whatever gifts and talents and you know the fruit of the Spirit. It's only when you're, the Spirit comes in you that you're born again. He's the one that brings your dead spirit to life. That makes sense? Judas Iscariot never had the Holy Spirit in him or upon his life because that is only for saved people. Jesus said of Judas, it would be better if that guy was never born. He calls him the son of perdition. He's not born again. Important to realize that. This exousia power is for a limited time on these 12, and we'll see it lasted about three months. This power authority he gave them. Do you know who else receives this exousia authority to do lying signs and wonders? The Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 13, five times it says that Satan gives the Antichrist and the false prophet exousia power to do lying signs and wonders. But anyway, here's the list of the 12 apostles who Jesus will soon send out into Israel, including Judas Iscariot, to do all these signs and wonders. By the way, they're not proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Jesus has not yet died. He wasn't buried. He hasn't risen from the dead. He's pro they're proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand because the king is here. So again, verse 2, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Notice these are given to us in pairs, because Jesus is going to send them out at the end of this chapter, two by two, into all of Israel. Anytime you read a list of these 12 in the four Gospels, it's always Peter first, and it's always Judas Iscariot last. What a motley crew they were. And it's amazing because Jesus prayed all night before he chose these 12. Peter would end up denying the Lord just before he was crucified. Judas again would betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. In between, the rest of them would stumble and bumble along at times as well. James and John, the two brothers, they were known as the sons of thunder. Uh, they wanted to call fire down from heaven and smoke and burn and turn the people of Samaria into little crispy critters. Jesus rebuked them. I, I love it because in Luke chapter 9, verse 55, Jesus turned, look at these verses, but he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them, James and John. Remember the apostle of love? You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. 
Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He was sent to save the world. He says it over and over again. But here it starts off with Simon. Again, his name is called Peter. Peter was the name Jesus gave him after he confessed who Jesus Christ was. He says, you are the Christ, the, the Son of the living God. And he says, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. So I'm going to call you Peter or Petros. It means a little stone. But upon this rock, I'll build my church. What's the rock? The rock, the name is Petra. It's the statement Peter made. Peter's not the rock upon which we build the church. The Catholic Church says, Peter's the rock. Are you kidding me? The guy's going to stumble and bumble along after the Spirit comes upon him. He's going to deny the Lord. He's going to do things that are wrong. He's going to commit hypocrisy when he's with Paul. He's going to withdraw from the Gentiles, won't eat with them, and Paul rebukes him. Again, years after Pentecost, but the church isn't built on Peter. It's built on the rock. Jesus is the rock. That statement Peter said, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. That is the Petra, the rock upon which the church is built. Then he mentions Andrew, P Andrew Peter's brother here. Andrew is neat because he's always bringing people to Jesus. There's a little, you know, Jesus is like, hey, you know, we've got to feed all these people. They're hungry. Jesus knew what he was going to do, but it says Andrew was the one that found the little boy that had the little Lunchable, and he brings him to Jesus, and Jesus blesses it and feeds them all with the little guy's lunch. So Andrew, again, James and John, they're brothers. James would be the first apostle martyred, and we read about it in the book of Acts. And then John is the only apostle who never died a, a horrible martyr's death. He he's the only one that lived to be about 100 years old. And God kept him around because he wanted him to write the book of Revelation. Then it mentions Philip and Bartholomew. Now this is where things get a little tricky with the names because Bartholomew is also called Nathaniel. Same person. Um, Philip is the one who came to his friend Nathaniel, Bartholomew, and he says, hey, we found the Christ. And he's from Nazareth, Jesus from Nazareth. And it was Nathaniel Bartholomew that said, is there anything good that comes out of Nazareth? I don't think so. But then it says Jesus saw Nathaniel Bartholomew, and uh, he said, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And he says, well, how do you know me? And Jesus said, well, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And all that's all he said to him. And it was Nathaniel Bartholomew said, You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. This is how Jesus responded to him. In John 1, verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. You, you think I'm the Messiah because I saw you under a fig tree? Cool. That was easy. Then there's Thomas and Matthew. Matthew's the one who wrote the gospel according to Matthew. We've already talked about him. He was the tax collector. Jesus said, Follow me, and he follows him. Thomas, though, he's also known with the nickname, what, Doubting Thomas? Why did he get that nickname? Because after Jesus rose from the dead, that first Sunday afternoon, he appears to the disciples. They're all gathered in the house. Jesus kind of comes through the wall. The doors were closed. The windows were closed, it says. He appears to them, and they're all blown away, and they think they're seeing a ghost. No, 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 touch my hand. You know, feel me. I'm a, I'm, it's me. Got anything to eat? I'll prove. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Jesus. He loves to eat. He's always eating. So, yeah, that's him. And so they tell, after Jesus leaves, they tell Thomas, who was not there, we've seen the Lord. He's risen. I'm not going to believe him that he's risen from. The I'm not going to believe you guys until I can put my finger in his hand and put my hand in his side where the spear went in. Then I might believe. So eight days later, it says, he, Jesus reappears, comes into the closed room, and Thomas is with them. And he says, hey, Thomas, come here. Put your finger right here. Put your hand right there. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And you remember his response. Thomas was blown away. His reaction is John 20, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, 
My Lord and my God literally means in the Greek, the Lord of me and the God of me. You know, some groups like JW say, oh, no, he never claimed that Jesus was God. He was just excited. You know, like a valley girl. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> That's not what he was doing. No, he was not excited. He was blown away. And he's saying, the Lord of me and the God of me. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me. We haven't seen him, but we believe, we trust, we believe the word of God because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Then we have James, he says here, the son of Alphaeus. Sometimes he's called James the Less. And Labius, he's also known as Thaddeus, and he's also known as Judas, son of James. So that's why we kind of get mixed up with the, the 12. The final two men are listed, Simon the Canaanite. He's also called Simon the Zealot. In other words, he was a freedom fighter for Israel who attacked the Romans and came against the Romans. And he was like a, I don't know, a terrorist in some ways, you know, just going and attacking and destroying as many Romans as he could. Well, this is the cast that Jesus puts together. Then Judas Iscariot, it says, the one who betrayed him, who said, it'd be better if that guy was never born. Anyway, after Jesus ascended into heaven, Judas, you know, he killed himself, jumped off the cliff with a rope, and then he just fell, and it says his innards all burst out. Read it in the, new, in the old King James. That's colorful. Right before lunch. That's always fun. But they say, well, we got to pick somebody else to replace Judas. So how are we going to do this? The Holy Spirit hasn't come upon him yet. So they say, like, you know what? Let's uh, draw straws. Cast lots. And it came down to Matthias. And so that's the one they picked to replace Judas. Do we ever hear anything about Matthias? No. You read anything after that? All it mentions is, yeah, they picked Matthias, and then you don't hear anything more about him. A few years later, Jesus will appear to a man named Saul of Tarsus, and he was a wild man. He was a Jewish rabbi. He had authority to go and arrest these Jesus freaks, wayward Jews, following after this, what Saul thought were, was a dead prophet, a false prophet named Jesus of Nazareth, and I'm going to beat these, you know, these followers of him back into submission. I'm going to kill them if I have to, and he did. I'm going to throw them in jail until they recant Jesus. That was Saul of Tarsus. And so he's got official papers We're going up to Damascus in Syria. He's going to bring these wayward Jews back, and on the way to Damascus, Jesus, the risen Lord, appears to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And from that moment on, he got saved. He turned his life to the Lord. Then he became known as the Apostle Paul. Jesus would radically change his life. He would use him in the most remarkable ways. Paul would literally become the Apostle to the Gentiles, even though Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was Jew to the core, but God says, no, I'm going to send you first and foremost to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he would plant churches all over the Roman Empire. He would write half the New Testament. Paul calls himself the least of all the apostles. So my vote, if you had to pick 12, it would be Paul over Matthias, but that's not for me to determine. Anyway, here's the important thing to realize about these guys. They were all... Far from perfect. As far as the world was concerned, these 12 men were uneducated, untrained doofuses. They were just illiterate. They didn't like them. They just thought these guys are smelly fishermen. Seven of them were. Most uneducated, untrained men around us. We don't want to hear anything they have to say, but here's what made them so successful. They followed Jesus. And that was the bottom line. When John and Peter get arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel to everybody there, the religious leaders have them arrested. They stand before them. And to me, it's one of the greatest compliments an unbeliever can give to us. We read about this in Acts chapter 4. After Peter says, 
you know, the name of Jesus. He's the only way to heaven. There's no other name given among men by which you must be saved. It's Jesus. So in Acts 4.13, this is what these leaders, these unbelievers, thought about them. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. But notice, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Again, that's the greatest compliment they could have received. And really, that's what the world needs to see in our lives, that we love Jesus. We spend time with Jesus. We spend time in His Word. We spend time in prayer. You know, we're light. We're salt to those around us. We allow the Holy Spirit to fill us up and use us for His glory. And so these men, were they the cream of the crop? No. Don't put them on, you know, this elevated place. You know, it's... I, I've gone into a lot of churches, a lot of beautiful cathedrals, and you'll see the 12 apostles. They all get the little glowing halo over their head, and this oh, they're so wonderful. And these guys are doofuses like us. They weren't any different. The only difference was Jesus working in them and through them, and that's not different because he does that with us as well. They were weak. They were frail on their own. They were mighty in the Lord because he's the one who empowered them. Again, the last apostle, who said he was the least of the apostles, Paul, this is what he writes. Now, don't take, well, yeah, take this personally. I've had people get offended when I just read these verses. I did, don't get mad at me. I didn't write this. But this is what he says of us. This is what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh... We're not, I'm not the brightest bulb in the batch. I know that. But he didn't say not any. So some of you are wise. I'm not. That's okay. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. But God has chosen. Here we go. The foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Okay. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. And here's the whole reason why, that no flesh should glory in His presence. None of us can stand before Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord, you're so good. But you got a good deal when you got me, didn't you? No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to say, wow, I'm the pick of the letter. Thank you. I knew you were going to use me. No, no flesh and glory in His presence because all the glory goes to Him. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus. That's the whole reason why God loves us and can use us because we are in Christ. He adopted us into His family. He saved us. He did everything for us. And we're in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness. That's why we're righteous because we're in Christ. Sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So here's the bottom line. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. But, Ephesians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So the rest of this chapter, again, deals with Jesus giving them specific instructions as he prepares to send them out to the Jewish people throughout Israel. So we'll look at a few of these. Uh, we won't go very far here, but look at verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. So this is not the gospel, because the gospel goes to every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, everybody in the world. This is about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, the king of the Jews, is here. So just go to verse 6 but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons freely you have received, freely give. And that's a good principle for whatever God has given you, He's given it to you by grace. It's a free gift He's given you. So freely give out what He's put into your life. It's not yours to keep and hold on to and be selfish with, he blesses us to be a blessing 
to others around us. It's hard for me to imagine how off, um, how awesome this was for these 12 men. I mean, for just a short time, again, maybe a few months, he gives them this exousia, authority and power to do these miraculous things. Again, this is the exception. This is not the rule. When we get to the book of Acts, they don't have that exousia power, but they will have the power, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit. This is why some Christians, again, they get confused about signs and wonders. And there's groups out there say, well, we should be going into hospitals, cleaning out all the hospitals, a very sick person. Well, sounds great. There was a church that broke off of our church back in the early 80s, not our church, but Calvary Chapel. And that's what they started having prophets show up saying, we're going to go into hospitals and we're going to clean out the hospitals. Everybody's going to be raised up, healed. We're going to have stadiums filled with resurrections. Did it happen? And he actually, the guy said, within two years. That was his mistake. He gave a date. <laughs> it didn't happen. False prophet. Ding, 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 ding. So all the verses they used to say these are what's going to happen were verses dealing with the millennial reign of Christ. For a thousand years, when Jesus comes back after the Great Tribulation, He establishes His kingdom. You and I will be in our resurrection bodies doing a lot of these things during that time because those who survive the great tribulation will go into the millennium in their natural bodies and they will you know procreate they'll build up a huge number of people for a thousand years and we're going to be used by the lord to do all kinds of amazing things like this so today yes god does heal today god is god and he does what he wants how he wants when he wants he can use us any of us no one person has the gift of healing. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 12, there are gifts of healings, not a gift of healing. So God can use you to lay hands on somebody, pray for them, but then trust God. If he heals them, great. Like Paul went to Timothy and said, well, you know, you might take a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments. Why didn't he just heal them if he had that exousia power? Well, he didn't. God is God. He does what he wants, how he wants. He says to Trophimus, I had to leave him sick there in Miletus. Why would Paul leave somebody that was close to him sick? Well, he didn't have the power to do it. God can do it. And, you know, Paul's sitting there working, you know, where was he, in Ephesus, and he's got all these sweaty headb you know, headbands on, he's blowing his nose in hankies, and he's throwing a pile over here. And it says people are coming to the pile of handkerchiefs, yeah. and they're taking them, going home with them, and demons were cast out of people with those things. Now, Paul never said, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm going to cut these up into little squares and sell them for $19.95. And you just take these little snotty rags and you just put them on people and they'll be healed. No, that's not how it works. God was doing a supernatural thing. So he does what he wants, when he wants. In the, in the millennial reign of Christ, we'll see this type of power again. This is a preview of coming attractions. For the most part, these guys are going to be rejected, even though they're doing all these miracles. Jesus is going to follow behind where they go, and he's going to do more things. And guess what? He comes into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, and everybody's saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is our Messiah. This is great. A week later, less than a week later, crucify him, crucify him. Why? What has he done? Crucify him. We have one king but Caesar. Not, you know, we only have one king. I mean, it was so sad. They rejected their Messiah. But even that, obviously, was a part of God's plan. He had to come. He had to die. He had to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Verse 9. He says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staves for a worker is worthy of his food. And we see this a lot in Northeast India when we send out church planters. They don't take a bunch of stuff with them. They just go in the power of the Spirit and they look for the house of peace. In other words, they'll go into the market square there, whatever village it might be, and they'll just sit there and hang out and start talking to people and, you know, they'll share Jesus. And they go, well, who's that? Well, then let me tell you about him. And, well, I want to hear more about this. So they say, oh, can you come into our house and our little hut, and we'll fix tea for you. Oh, sure. And then he explains, and so often they'll get saved, and then pretty soon a Bible study starts. Sometimes the whole village 
20, 30, 50 families all get saved? I mean, that's God. And so that's what they were doing. They just go out, see what the Lord does. It says, whatever, verse 11, now whatever city or town you enter, inquire of it who is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, it simply means, you know, if they receive you, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Verse 14, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that city or house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city? We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God sent fire and brimstone down and just wiped the, the whole city, all the people, just Lot, who was a compromising believer. His, wall, his wife turned into a pillar of salt. His two daughters, they're the only ones that escape. And God says, or Jesus says here, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for these cities that reject the good news of Jesus? Hmm. Why is that? Well, the simple reason is Sodom and Gomorrah never had that kind of godly witness. They never had people coming in, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, and then still get rejected. By the way, all the nations of the world who have heard the gospel of Christ, who have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, including our nation, which is in a free fall away from Christ right now, all nations will be judged during the great tribulation, the time of God's wrath and judgment, which is coming in the near future. A little over seven years from now. Well, that's when Jesus comes back a little over seven years from now, but be that as it may. Um, our nation is in a free fall. We need to pray for those around us. You remember I, I quoted a stat a few, week, a few weeks ago. This, this survey was done about four or five months ago, talking to those who identify, that's a good word, identify as born-again Christians. And of those who identify as born-again Christians, about 50% said, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Think about that. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The one Peter said, there's, no sal there's salvation, no other. It's only Jesus. And yet, 50% of born-again Christians are saying, no, no, there's other ways. Like Buddha. Really? You're going to believe a fat guy that sits there and goes, oh, really? That's, a, that's your answer? What's he going to do for you? Here, have another donut. We do that in the foyer, so no big deal. It's not going to save you. Stick a th sword to your throat, like Muhammad. That's what Allah told him to do, according to him and either receive all of the moon god, by the way, or we're going to cut your head off. That's not the way of Jesus. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. So for born-again Christians, they say, oh, there's more ways to heaven. Well, I say 50% about six months ago when the survey was done. They just came out with a new survey last week. I just saw the stat. Um, now it's 70% of those who call themselves born-again Christians say Jesus is not the only way to heaven. We're in a free fall because it was only like 10 years ago when it was the opposite. It was like 70% said, no, Jesus is the only way. Now they're saying he's not. Let's end right here. Good place to stop. We'll pick up Lord willing next week. Jesus has got a lot of you know, instructions for us, lots of principles that he gives these 12 apostles that are very applicable for you and me today. And he's going to talk about fear a lot and why they don't have to be in fear. But there's a lot of things that are trying to scare us today in the world around us. But these will be very applicable for where we are in our journey with the Lord.